Welcome back, everybody. Today, we are here to talk about growth hormone. What's going on, Dr. Dean? How you doing? Very good, Kurt. It was a pleasure to come back again. I think we had quite a number of topics to pick from yeah. over our discussions the last uh, few weeks. I think we had taurine and PPAORs, but I think for a little entertainment i thought we'll delve into growth hormone and look at maybe some myths or misconceptions because to be honest there's just a lot of <laughs> probably the most misinformation peptide if we're going to call it that mm -hmm. over or over a hormone that it's you have so much conflicting information surrounding dosing different types of growth hormone the sort of cellular interactions, the direct, the non-direct, it, it just, it seems like everyone has their own take on how growth hormone should be used in like the, I guess, sports physique environment. Mm -hmm. But we know it's used in a completely different manner from a, a clinical setting or yes. a, a prescribed setting on, on what the actual dosages are. Yeah, and depending on what it's prescribed for. Yeah pretty yeah. much so i don't know what in europe it's used for but in the united states there are some states that still allow it to be used for anti-aging purposes but that's generally considered off-label and illegal where i live that's illegal it would only be for delayed growth in children hiv wasting chronic kidney disease and I'm trying to think if there's any other uh short bowel syndrome which is really rare it's uh, it's actually it is illegal here, so we don't have any of the, the sort of longevity clinics T or T's about as far as it goes. I do know some of the T or T clinics in the UK. I was speaking with one recently. They're trying to seek some sort of loophole in order to be able to prescribe. I think the loophole allows. 1.5 IUs to be prescribed to okay. um, someone who is potentially deficient in growth hormone based on a set of symptoms. Um, and I think it, there's like an age defined criteria to it as well. So it's it's very, very strict. It's not like you're going to walk in and walk out with a prescription for a, a genotrope and 36 <laughs> IU pen or, or size N or whatever pharmaceutical GH and that we have uh, on label in the uk so it is it's one of those ones that we haven't fallen into not a trap but basically the whole longevity aspect of okay. low dose growth hormone with trt okay yeah for here where i live in new jersey the most common use is for hiv wasting and there's only one brand that's allowed and that's a serastim made by yeah. emd serrano and that it's it's its own kind of loophole as well. So if you have Medicaid, it's free if you have HIV, right? To aid to help people with HIV, they can't afford the medicine because the retail of the drug uh, ranges from about five thousand to seven thousand dollars a box, and they get four boxes a month. So you'd be at two hundred eighty thousand dollars a year in growth hormone right. alone. So, right. so no one's going to pay that much money for it. So Medicaid will will give it to people with HIV for free. They had to they had to cut down on the dosing. Um, qualifications to just HIV because technically where I live, most of the state workers have Medicaid as well. So the loophole would be if they, if the HIV people can get it, then anyone with Medicaid could get qualified for free. So EMD Serrano is not going to have that because that would be a, an incredible loss of profits for them. Yeah, absolutely. You're getting I the drug mean, for free. I mean, what's the do dose for HIV? Kakaxi is Eight, uh, six, six milligrams, six yep. milligrams dosed at night. It's, for anyone sort of listening, that's uh, it's an absolutely incredible amount of growth hormone to, to take in one go. It's so people understand the math because I get one of the questions I get asked a lot is how to dilute growth hormone. And so, if you're going to use serostim as an example, one milligram should equal three IUs. Correct. That's how it should be diluted. So serostim, for instance, if you were diluting it for use outside of HIV, it would be diluted with 1.8 mLs of water to yield right three i use would equal one one milligram so the same with any of the generics assuming you know your the milligrams that are in the bottle that's the problem is a lot of the stuff that's on the black market you don't know what the milligram dose is so the standard just become became one ml of water right but that yeah, can be too uh, low or too high um, uh, basically the underground stuff was dosed at 
a unit weight so it's like a 10 iu bottle which you know when you when you really work it out it's like consider one milligram is three ius you're accounting that there's 3.33 milligrams in that underground vial for 10 mm -hmm. ius so yep. it's it, it it confuses people especially when they sort of look at some pharmaceutical products that come in milligrams some that come in ius it, it can be a bit of a, a minefield to try and understand so the use one like you said is one milligram equals three ius yeah standard. so with the 18 units uh, like you said so for hiv it's given as one bolus dose it's diluted with point it generally it's diluted with 0.5 mls of water sericin specifically as a, a genotropin and some of the other pharmaceutical ones have almost no fillers in them there's just phosphoric acid and sucrose yeah. so it dissolves really easily and it doesn't irritate the skin generally as we can get into that in a minute with the generics so it allows for less dilution that way you're not destroying your skin if you're trying to push you wouldn't be pushing 1.8 mls of water under your skin correct as for performance enhancing uh i tried a bottle a day at 18 units before bed your weight goes up dramatically really quickly it was almost a kilogram a day for a period of time almost for two weeks straight the majority of that is just going to be fluid Yep. Uh, what's interesting though part of the reason why it's done in a bolus at night versus split up is glycemia control is much better so we discovered that especially for children that have trouble with their blood sugar if you give it as a bolus dose before night because that natural insulin response that happens after you fall asleep it it clears that out much faster than if you gave it during the day and then because otherwise people would be becoming diabetic correct correct and, 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 and it's no, I was going to say, and the, the nighttime dosing plays off like what we spoke before about. I guess the nuance here is like insulin, an in, intramuscular injection has a completely different onset of action to sub Q. So obviously, right. IM is going to have a rapid clearance into the body versus having to so, partition its way through sub Q, through fat, and into obviously systemic circulation. It's It's a lot slower. So we know that sub Q delivery of GH is about three to four hours for peak onset. <clears throat> and someone asked me, well, does that not mean that when I inject growth hormone, that it's not working immediately? And the way I explained it was not, not necessarily you have that dose has gone into the system and it's slowly rising and it's at hour three, hour four, that you hit the peak of your sort of serum growth hormone peaking, but you still have growth hormone in your system. It's just not at the peak level until hour three or hour four. So for someone who's taking, you know, two IUs of growth hormone before cardio in the morning, straight before they head to the gym, more than likely by the time you've come home and you've started to eat your first meal, say after four that's hours, me. that's when the growth hormones peak and that, there's no problem to using growth hormone for lipolysis in that instance, but the timing matters that Correct. you're probably better off doing growth hormone and the waiting three hours and then doing it or do it the night before and let it work in your sleep and then take advantage of that fast environment the next yeah. morning. But it's all like, again, very critical nuance that when people are like, there's a secret protocol or two, I use a growth <laughs> hormone before fast cardio that, when you really break it down for them and you explain to them about the timing, it's not that it doesn't work, it's that your timing's completely off. So if you've done it, like I said, three hours before cardio, I meant to done your cardio, then great. You may be utilizing some more fatty acids during that cardio because of the lipolytic effect of growth hormone. But the other side of it was we've seen that you sort of quickly hit a ceiling of the effect of lipolysis with I think it's up to two. I use a growth hormone. Or where you sort of one point seven is generally where you see. It. Yeah, but so you could just round up to two, basically. We're bodybuilders have uh -huh. more muscle than you know the people studied. So, and from there, you don't see any further effects. So it's not like if someone's telling you like do four. I use before your fasted cardio. Two was picked for a reason. It's just the timing. You have to it's make more. sure that it's it's two or three hours before your cardio, and then you're away to go. Yeah, assuming that even. And that's a whole nother discussion, but assuming that even fasting cardio makes a difference in the fat loss because fat loss versus fat burning are two entirely different things. What there is though, so there is that ceiling effect of growth hormone effect on fat loss, but there is also a, an indirect effect of insulin growth factor one on fat loss 
although there is no IGF-1 receptor on fat cells. What it seems to be occurring is it seems to be blocking the uptake of fat into fat cells. So you're getting kind of like a yohimbine type effect as well. So it's it's additive, right? Because if you've taken two units of HGH and then you've taken four, six, or you know, up, you'll notice that the fat loss generally continues to go up with the dose, although the science, the typical science doesn't support that. That's just what that is. The, the straight GH effect is capped, but then you have IGF effect after that. Right. Like when you and take, also, no, I was going to say you touched on. Units, you generally get more fat loss, but. Well, another thing that I guess is often lost or under, misunderstood or not probably even taught or educated on is lipoprotein, lipase, LPL, and hormone sensitive lipase, mm -hmm. which are the two critical hormone sensitive enzymes that are controlling how fat is lost from a cell or how fat is put into a cell. And so what we're talking about there is the inhibition of lipoprotein lipase LPL, which puts fat into adipocytes. So if we can block LPL's action, we won't be putting fatty acids into the cell. And then obviously the other side of it, which is the whole, again, myth surrounding insulin causing fat storage in cells, it's got to do a hormone sensitive lipase where hormone sensitive lipase releases fats from your cells. And that's all predicated off that IGF-1 insulin growth hormone sort of interaction with the cell. So when we're talking about here, we're, we're focusing on LPL being blocked so that you're not putting fats back into cells. So your chances of the fats that are released through lipolysis, which is what we were talking about with fat burning and fat utilization, taking the fat out of cells and then being able to utilize that fat as energy by the mitochondria or the liver or whatever is where the key fat loss is coming from. Yep. And these are things that compounds like trembolone and testosterone also interact with those as well. Correct. That aid in the fat loss that you see. So it's not just androgen receptor mediated fat loss as people think. Correct. Yeah. As far as dosing for, I, I think the most, the, the other most common one I get is dosing for muscle growth for growth hormone versus for fat loss, right? So you have, I feel like there's three classes of people that generally are interested in growth hormone. You have the anti-aging population yep. you have the fat loss population and then you generally have the bodybuilders or strongman guys who want to then leverage it for hyperplasia and i say that because i i think where it's confusing is growth hormone itself is not growing muscle as as no. gh as it exists igf will what? do that um correct but it requires that output from the gh um what do you find we probably align in this but i'm curious what you think about for muscle growth in terms of dosing uh, one thing that i often go back to if we're and i don't like we we talked about this before with like milligram per kilogram dosing because our, our response the amount of growth hormone that we produce is not linear to body weight so mm -hmm. as you get bigger and bigger as a bodybuilder your growth hormone production naturally from the pituitary pretty much stays the same so if we sort of look at I guess prepubescent production when we're in our sort of most active development phase of life. They've traced it back to anywhere from 0 0.06 IUs per kilogram up to 0 0.18 IUs per kilogram. And that's sort of where you end up with six IUs to the stair stem 18 IUs mm -hmm. dose of growth hormone. Based on the fact that, you know, six IUs is probably the bottom end of the range for pre-puberty development, if we were to mimic that growth aspect of our life, somewhere from my opinion, between four to six IUs is where you're going to start into that curve of where growth was occurring during adolescence. Obviously, you can be crazy and you can push out to 18, but like what we discussed, going from six to 18 doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be triple the growth or triple the igf1 because again we have to consider what is going on once that gh goes into systemic circulation how much of it is going to the liver how much of it is acting in a i guess an autocrine versus paracrine mm -hmm. fashion it's not just more gh means more muscle growth along with anabolics there's a very fine balance of keeping thyroid hormone health happy 
keeping glycemic control happy and then obviously helping with the hyperplasia through IGF-1. So for me, I think, you know, four to six I use, four I use before bed. And my, for this is what I personally feel before bed on a, I guess, a training day is how I approach it, that you're utilizing it for recovery, then following resistance training that day. You're also improving your sleep quality. So again, you're waking up the next morning with a better refreshed nervous system to facilitate training the next day or facilitate recovery if it's a rest day the next day. And you're not running into the issues where you're chronically using growth hormone every single day that again turns into a, a battle of managing glycemic control and thyroid function from that chronic stimulation of growth hormone. Yep. Yeah, I would say the same. I would say somewhere around five is kind of the beginning of, of hyperplasia from that. And for most people, up to 10 seems about reasonable. And I would do the same thing. I would leverage it in one bolus at night. I, I, I find the only reason why I would ever split it is if fat loss is the primary goal, because then you're hitting the GH metric multiple times throughout the day. But if, if fat loss and muscle growth is your goal, the bolus is totally acceptable as a way to do it. Yeah, and doing and I mean, that at least during the day, at least what I've seen is when you, if you did the if you did ten IU's first thing in the morning, you'd probably be asleep by lunchtime. More than likely, you're you're gonna have such a huge increase in sleep pressure from growth hormone. And I mean, I mean, I has done four or five IU's in the morning time, thinking more is better. More than likely, has hit that crash in the afternoon yep. where you just have this urge to sleep. Um, I think with the other side of it you get leveraging with guys and this is another sort of adjunct then is long acting insulin as a, an adjuvant to growth hormone use in order to leverage off insulin interacting potentially at its receptor alongside igf1 and you get guys who are going to use stuff like insulin glargine and lantus alongside growth hormone as this magic stack between the two and probably more so the, the Atlantis is probably offering some level of potentially controlling your sort of glycemic control of your food through this basal insulin in the background. But it's not this whole thing that you've done a brilliant post on it. People often don't look at exogenous insulin still creating insulin sensitivity issues mm -hmm. it's sort of viewed that giving this exogenous insulin is taking stress away from the pancreas which in one aspect the beta cells yes aren't producing this 16 to 20 i use atlantis insulin in the background throughout the day but the cells still have to maintain their i guess receptor integrity so and we know that the insulin receptor is one of the most beautiful examples of down regulation yeah of internalization of the receptor if there's too high of a stimulus of insulin over a long period of time. So there's there's value in some aspects to a long acting insulin with growth hormone use, but also it can make the problem so much more worse, worse if the underlying basics of maintaining the receptor's sensitivity aren't understood by the person. Yeah. I would, I usually just state that things like Lantus are generally better for people that actually have an issue with insulin production. Correct. It's going it, to, the data that a lot of the bodybuilders are citing is data from people with diabetes. It's not necessarily causing cell preservation in a, in a normal person. If I were to use Lantus, it would cause harm to my pancreas most likely. Yeah. It's, you know, the way it has to be based off looking at metrics like c-peptide fasting insulin and seeing is there a need for that exogenous insulin based off what those numbers are saying it's not just a matter of just falling in line with a with a protocol i guess do you decide that not to go off in a tangent but long acting insulins don't really bring the increased appetite response which is often you know i guess not educated, but spoken about in terms of aerospace that you've got guys doing 40, 60 IUs mm -hmm. of Lantus insulin that, you know, when you look at really what the pancreas makes on a basal level, it, it it's, it's about 20 IUs per day. And that's why 
the fact of the half-life of glargine being about 24 to 36 hours, that's why they're told to take it like ins- like growth hormone before bed because mm-hmm. it ma- maintains insulin secretion, insulin levels during nighttime fasting. Yeah. Uh, that doing 40 IUs of Lantus insulin, it, it doesn't create the same sort of ghrelin response as doing like 10 IUs of rapid actin insulin where glyce- like basically glycation and the removal of glucose is pretty much rapid. The 40 IUs of Lantus probably is just as effective as 20 you know unless you're really severely type 1 diabetic and you need yeah. quite a lot of background insulin control yeah and the the only other the only other time i would think it's appropriate to use insulin in general too is if it if the food required to maintain a size or to get to a size is is beyond what your pancreas can handle i think a lot of younger guys just assume that insulin is just naturally anabolic on its own and by adding it to these stacks that it's going to cause some level of anabolism that you would get you would not get without it and that's just simply not the case. Again, they're looking at studies in people with extreme situations like burn victims. There's metabolic things going on in burn victims that are just not occurring in people without those yeah. disorders. Um, yes, I mean, without totally going on a tangent, I think for most guys, probably not needed. If you manage the growth hormone properly, the dose and the timing generally, assuming you're not already pre diabetic. And I, that's, you, you know, but that brings up like an interesting sidetrack is HbA1c measurement in blood star. You know, for me, a HbA1c of for our sort of UK measurement, millimole per millimole, it's 31. I'm not too sure what that is percentage wise for US. I think it's like maybe 4.4, 4.5%. I mean, oh, 5.2, 5.3 is yeah. sort of pre, pre-diabetic pre cutoff. We consider 5.7 now. 5.7, right. <laughs> which is high. We've increased it over time. And I keep that, mine is at 5. I keep mine at a 5. For for hours, um, I think it goes to 42 millimole per millimole, which works out at an average fast and blood glucose of 7 millimole, which I think US terms about 120. Yeah, which is right. That matches up. So, here. so, so around there, like to me, once your blood sugar goes above like ninety, morning fasting is above ninety, which is like five, five point one. You're you're heading towards insulin sensitivity issues where you're going to see increased glycation, where you're putting glucose onto the red blood cells, or you're glycating proteins. Carbonylation is happening. There's all these sort of advanced glycation products that are happening in the body that speeds up aging. That. Yeah to save your longevity keep your fast and blood glucose under five and that way you know your insulin sensitivity is staying optimal correct yeah and in those cases if you're already in those situations i wouldn't be using growth hormone no and then i, would I wouldn't lose, be adding... i would probably lose body fat or whatever's causing that issue first and then there's there's certain instances with potentially insulin usage when you see someone who has maybe um the criteria of the insulin resistance for PCOS, where you see actually that the insulin output is very low, that you might actually enhance metabolic health with insulin in that instance because the insulin production is low, but the insulin resistance is high. So you're sort of meeting in the middle. But outside of that, it really like when it comes to like long acting insulin, like what we said, you're best off saving it for somebody who's type one diabetic who yeah. needs stable insulin in the background. And if you if you need to utilize insulin for to get food in, well then Humilogra. utilize yeah, utilize a rapid acting insulin that you again another sort of thing, do not <laughs> I guess any mini miny mo your insulin dose of mm-hmm. I'm just gonna take ten ten mm-hmm. IUs and eat to the insulin response has to be the other way around plan your food and then same know, the diabetic uses it you know diabetic diabetic guidelines for every 10 grams of carbs is approximately one iu of mm-hmm. a long uh, a, sorry short acting humalog or no rapids so 50 grams of carbs five four to five i use and that way you can gauge your glycemic response to that insulin but also know that the second peak and this is a big thing that I guess that we don't see with the administration of growth hormone, growth hormone peaks, somatostatin peaks with it, and then it drops off. 
insulin that's injected peaks and then because of the absorption kinetics you get a second dairy delayed peak from it as well and that sometimes catches guys out with getting sort of an edgy hypo event yep. where the second peak hits them where they think they're out of the clear and making sure that you have some level of glucose handy if you do have that and it starts to affect you in terms of even like drowsiness driving your car lapse in concentration that's a big part that is i guess often oversought when a dose of insulin is picked yeah, yeah. and it, and that mimics similar to what the body does right so you have monophasic and biphasic release so when someone eats just protein for instance there's a monophasic release the pancreas releases whatever it has stored as a big burst and then it, would, it senses that there's no glucose really in the blood so it's not going to continue to pump out insulin because there's nothing to bring down um, right. But when you eat, like if you eat right rice alone, you'll get a biphasic wave until the glucose comes down into comes range. Down. And that's what these guys are seeing with the injecting insulin, but they're they're only matching it with one meal or one bowl of glucose. They need more than one to keep. Correct. And it's it's often one that guys who are doing like, but like one of the things that I think, it, not, not dangerous, but really understand what you're doing. And a case of probably less is more is, doing insulin pre-workouts where you're you're really playing at <laughs> a tightrope of having just enough carbohydrate in your intra-workout drink and your pre-workout meal to keep up with that yeah. biphasic release and hope that that second peak doesn't hit you when you've when you're pretty much in the depths of training and you're keeping up with the demand for glucose in your bloodstream to keep yeah. up with that insulin well, that always seemed kind of silly to me as well, because the goal there is to grow, right? So, but if you're fighting hypoglycemia the entire time you're working out, how much effort are you really putting into working out? Right now, you're just yeah. injecting sugar all the whole time you're in the gym versus just lifting and not worrying about those things. It seems so Correct. complicated for no reason. Again, if you're at the stage in your bodybuilding career where that 1% matters, that's a different situation. If you're a pro yeah. and you're going to the Olympic stage, that's probably a metric you need to play with. But for the average guy watching this video, probably not something they need to deal with. The risk is not worth what they might possibly get out of it. I see very few people that really need to be using this stuff. Correct. Not to mention the pumps that you get from doing something like that are absolutely horrific. If if you know what you're doing and you do it right, it can be pretty, pretty painful in terms of like lower back pumps, quad pumps, arm pumps that uh, it probably makes the workout i'm not gonna say less effective but you're you're not able to handle as much load because the pump is so strong in terms of nutrient delivery trying to keep up with that glycemic control uh, yeah it's great if you're absolutely shredded and you want to look pretty impressive and inflate very quickly yes maybe but for your average gym girl that's listening to this like yeah. you said unless you're on heading out to the olympia stage and you're doing some uh Milos magicianry it's <laughs> it's not it's not worth it no what are some other things you see with growth hormone that you feel are misunderstood or misinterpreted you think i think the other one is sort of like having to take t4 alongside okay. growth hormone that there's what's the easiest way to explain this we, well, we get labs first of all <laughs> you should well, be labs, checking your lab, labs. Lab, yeah. lab, labs would be the first thing and obviously what we were speaking about before we come on we know that somatostatin influences uh, TSH production. So when somatostatin is elevated, TSH gets suppressed. So if we know somatostatin inhibits TSH production, TSH's primary goal is to stimulate T4 production mm -hmm. from the thyroid and then from that T3 is created. So part and parcel is you create T4 and T3 out of TSH at the thyroid gland. So if you inhibit TSH synthesis or output from the pituitary to the thyroid, your total T4 level will drop. But that doesn't necessarily mean that your free T4 level will drop with it. Correct. And you're nor and, your T3 necessarily. And, and, yeah, and your T3 as well. So I think even when we sort of look at labs, it's really important that we we focus in on the free thyroid hormone as opposed to the total. And I know a lot of guys don't test the total anymore because that's showing you exactly what is free from yep. thyroglobulin. But also 
if your T4 pool is low in terms of your free T4 pool and your T3 level is normal, then we have a, obviously a compensation here where your T4 is being pushed to T3 active wise. In that instance, then maybe you would assess the total T4 with the low T free T4 to see where the T4 balance is sitting. But if you know that T4 is getting pushed to T3 and the free T3 is sitting in an optimal position of say four, then there's no need to be putting more T4 into the system alongside growth hormone. Because one of the things that T4 increases is thyroid bonding yeah. globulin. Yeah. So you're putting T4 in and it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be free. And subsequently from that, the more T4 that goes in, the more TBG you can potentially make, which means you've got less free T4. Free. And then also from that less free T3 because the T4 converting to T3 from it. So it's, again, it's one of those ones where labs are so important to dictate what's going on and doing the correct labs to give you the right, right answer because T4 as a monotherapy, even to me from like a hypothyroid perspective, tends to not make too much sense. No, I would usually and use armor. You, so you can use armor where you've got a combination of the two, or my view over the last few years has been using T3 as a monotherapy, knowing that T3 doesn't necessarily drive up TBG by itself. The whole argument, and again, we're going off in a little tangent, but the argument against T3 monotherapy is that it suppresses TSH. Now, to me, that's a, like a no SHIT Sherlock moment of you give the body more T3, going to make less. T TSH is going to drop. It's the exact same. You give someone T or T, LH and FSH drop. So it's completely logical that TSH will drop with more free T3 because the body doesn't have to stimulate the production of T4 because you're sustaining a normal level of T3. The other side to me is T4's half-life is five to seven days. T3's half-life is 24 hours. Very easy for someone to build up a level of tyrotoxicity from too much T4 over a period of time because of how long T4 stays in the body. And you will get people who probably think then more is better. So it'll go from the prescription of 100 micrograms of T4 to 200 thinking, okay, I'm going to double the amount of active thyroid hormone. And like I said, TBG probably just goes up and robs yeah. you of your, your thyroid hormone. Right. So T, T4 use with growth, um, do your labs and assess. Yeah. Don't, fall, don't fall into abstract science of your thyroid goes to crap with growth hormone. It's... Yeah completely depending on on what's going on from like somatostatin level and again that's probably you know if you're doing that sort of bolus dose before bed where you're getting one peak and one peak sort of controlled somatostatin release to that bolus injection during the day then your natural sort of ghrelin response creating growth hormone in terms of that stimulation axis isn't probably going to have that knock-on effect onto TSH output versus if you're doing like a fat loss sort of lipolytic dosing schedule of two IUs every six hours. Well, then every four hours when that two IUs peaks, somatostatin is coming out to play with it as well. That can have a knock-on effect to TSH and then T4 drops with it. So labs don't just throw yeah. T4 in with growth from the start. Yeah. Like, like, like the Lantus insulin. Yeah, and seek help if you don't know how to interpret the labs correctly. Correct. Or at least so you can know what labs to get, right? Not <laughs> Most doctors aren't writing for the right thyroid stuff. And also T3 is a supplement as well as catabolic. I wouldn't, very rarely do guys need to add T3 to a diet. Uh, it, it, exactly. You know, unless, and this is sort of where during a diet where, you know, maybe eight weeks out from a show, depending on how long you're dieting, I'm making the assumption this is a 20-week diet. So you've been mm -hmm. dieting for 12 weeks. At that point, do a quick lab draw to see where your free T3 level is. If it's above four, you, you do not need T3 or T4. And from that, you can really know that this whole metabolic slowdown from dieting you know, is, is a bit of nonsense. There is some truth to it, but in terms of having to 
always use thyroid hormone in terms of like a, a fat loss phase it, it might not even be warranted depending on how efficient the system is underneath how well your sort of balance of nutrient intake like what we talked about in the first one about selenium iodine magnesium staying on top of those micronutrients probably keeps the system in an overall state of balance because no one's going to be tyrosine deficient with a high protein no. diet no and using appropriate refeeds or high Correct. days and things like that also can go a long way in aiding this instead of rushing right to taking t3 pretty if much yeah. intake is managed properly by your coach then generally you don't need t3 yep yeah and i mean i proved it it went the very last prep i done i put up my blood so i do done bloods at like 12 weeks out and my thyroid panel was completely perfect and it was sort of like i made a joke about it on the post on instagram going up now it's time to throw in 50 micrograms of t3 <laughs> you know in my t my free t3 level i think it was 5.6 that yeah. you know it, it do your bloods if there is a need potentially for thyroid replacement then that's at your discretion and your coach but don't just follow a cookie cutter if like no. your coach tells you now it's time for t3 question do i need it because yeah. more than likely when it comes to carving up that's a new variable that you have to entertain that you have i guess controlled metabolism from that 25 micrograms of t3 because of how it affects your tsh so you're really relying on that dosing schedule of that t3 keeping your thyroid hormone metabolism optimal versus having a background tsh or uh, t4 production to compensate over time yeah I'm trying to so, think what else what else about growth hormone seems misunderstood we could do another video sometime probably just on tsh as well i feel like that's a very misunderstood one as it affects uh, testosterone uh, absolutely um, i get i guess one thing that i came into my head there fed versus fasted dosing of growth hormone okay. of having to avoid eating carbohydrates when you're taking exogenous Correct. growth hormone so same as <laughs> so say, same as anything else like the testosterone it's you're going to bypass a lot of these these feedback loops. it's the way i generally explain to people is if you look at the instructions from any of the pharmaceutical growth hormones it doesn't once mention being fasted pharmaceutical companies will, will happily tell you to take without food if that's required for the drug to be efficient and it doesn't mention that anywhere i know with hiv it's given right before like if they're in the hospital it's given to them right before bed regardless of food and at home the instruction is to just take it before bed it does not mention yeah. don't eat for so many hours or i i'm not sure i guess it comes from the endogenous production that people are confusing that with but when you're, you're forcing a situation so the food is irrelevant I, and uh, like i mean and that's probably where some level of miscommunication surrounding peptide science like the growth hormone releasing peptides that rely on the ghrelin loop mm -hmm. to yeah. uh, pulse pulse out growth hormone from the pituitary or the growth hormone releasing hormones like cjc or yep. hypermorelin that they potentially need to be in a fast environment to uh, create that sort of feedback loop to be in positive favor of pulsing out growth hormone but from an exogenous growth hormone situation that ghrelin insulin sort of feedback loop does is irrelevant because you've you've injected four i use a growth hormone it's going into your system whether you like it or not yeah yeah and your body's not going to counteract it like uh, that pretty much yeah that is yeah that is a, a good one um i think if there was anything else about growth hormone that i i get asked often a pharmaceutical versus generic the only difference that i've seen i'd be curious to see your thoughts at least in the United States, you see less fake generics nowadays. I think 10 years ago, there were all sorts of things being passed off as GH. The only yeah, difference, yeah. and analyzed numerous samples of different labs, the only difference I see is the binders and the fillers tend to be different. As far as the purity, it's really not far off. Um, the binders and fillers can cause irritation, though, on the skin, <laughs> if it's not diluted properly, especially. I don't personally see much at least the stuff that seems available now stateside i don't know what your impression is over there 
No, I think what what's what's available here is pretty pretty accurate in terms of purity. Like, I mean, peptide synthesis where we are now, you know, ten years on, like you said, it's very easy to get hold of a, a like. A, a ba basically, when, when we create peptides, you basically tell it the instructions of adding yeah. what sequence together of, of amino acids, and it basically does coupling reactions of one peptide to the next. And then, I guess the the magic happens as as the peptide grows and grows and grows that it folds correctly. That's probably yeah. the the big part to it. And then, following the synthesis, it's it's obviously done in an aqueous environment done in, in mm -hmm. solution is the freeze drying aspect Correct. to create obviously the, the cake, the lyophilized cake. So uh, peptide synthesizers, lyophilizers pretty much are readily available now versus, you know, 12, 13 years ago, I remember in mm -hmm. our chemistry lab, we were like one of the first labs in Ireland to have a peptide synthesizer in our lab. That was really cool because it was basically, yeah, uh, you had a computer system, but you had basically this sort of rack where you attached, you know, seven or eight different vials of amino acids into it. And it basically then done the coupling Make reactions the in the middle of, of adding, you know, protecting chains onto the amino acids and coupling based on what you told the computer yeah. to add and react at the, the appropriate times. Yeah. And um, it'll put the and then, by bridges and all those things were, were appropriate. Pretty much, and then after that, then the solution you're left with, you could take that over. There was a life flies in the lab, and it would freeze dry it, and so to leave you with your powdered peptide in in the round bottom flask. So, I guess from from a purity perspective, yeah, what's sort of there from a a generic standpoint, you are probably getting something that is quite as pure as pharmaceutical, but again, you are. Now, unless you have something that is HBLC tested for structure and, and mass spec, I guess confirmed, mm -hmm. it is a bit of a, a risk. And I was laughing when you said about like 12, 13 years ago, a lot of generic growth hormone would have been faked to a HCG. Yeah. And the, the sort of old school, I remember whenever mm -hmm. I used to read forms was you could just do a pregnancy test to your That's growth it. hormone at night and then the next morning do a pregnancy test and see was it HCG or not. And yep. the, the amount of people that were getting scammed with fake growth hormone that was HCG was hilarious. <laughs> the <laughs> only one I've seen in recent times that was used as a fake would be IGF LR3 because it's cheaper to produce and it gives the same kind of side effects that people will think right and it'll elevate your IGF. But that's still rare. I mean, most, my understanding is most of the black market GH is coming from the same place in China. Anyway, there's basically one big factory that's making most of it. And it's made to those reseller specs. They'll tell the lab what milligram they're looking for and they just produce a black top or a blue top or whatever. You know, yep. the only other thing that I thought would be interesting to touch on because it's a new product is Somatrogan. Yeah, we know. We could we could touch on it. We could also do a whole video on it separately. I just my initial thought with it. So it is somatrogen is the the new long acting growth hormone, and like most things, bodybuilders will tend to abuse anything they can get their hands on. The, the short of it is, it's not pure growth. It's not pure growth hormone because it would be called somatropin. It's somatrogen because they took twenty eight uh, amino acids from HCG okay. and attached it to extend the life. So unlike a testosterone or nanobox nerd where they use an ester to slow down the release they change the protein structure so it's not actually just gh you're getting and it's to mimic placental output Put, of growth yeah. and it's not really stimulating igf1 the same way it would be more igf2 so you're looking for bone growth you're not looking for other growth uh, yeah uh, and obviously <clears throat> there's a, a fine balance during placental development between IGF-1 and IGF-2 in terms of how, aside from genetic defects like dwarfism arises or delayed osteoblast growth, that it's, I guess like you said, it's it's one of the things that you'll get guys thinking, oh, this is delayed acting growth hormone, therefore, you know, I'll do a massive dose of it and it's going to ride this wave for what hcg's half-life is tr like 24 36 hours 36 hours roughly so we can probably estimate that the 
this sort of onset of action of this Soma Trogan is going to stay in the body for quite a long time, like HCG, that it's going to cause potentially unwanted interactions that if you don't understand the pharmacology of it, like you said, IGF-2 leading to bone growth, bone mineralization, potential issues with calcium metabolism, parathyroid. There's all these different avenues that could play off this that, again, sounds great on paper that you've got this long-acting growth hormone, but from a, an application perspective, uh, what place does it have from it? No, I don't think uh, any. Think, no. <laughs> I, I would say it's one of those things, if it's not broken, don't fix it. There is nothing wrong for, for adults using it for anti-aging, fat loss, or muscle gain. There's nothing wrong with the traditional method of using growth hormone. This was because children weren't keen on taking multiple injections, and they didn't need their IGF elevated so high to get the linear bone growth. That's why it's only to be, it, on the instructions, it says it's used the age 3 to 18. It has not really been studied outside of that group. And I'm not really sure what side effects, it, like the things you listed, but it could cause some pretty atrocious side effects down the road. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's crazy that, well, I, like and like you said about the, the drug delivery, like the HCG complexation, we're even like in terms of like IGF LR3 or IGF DES, we've, we've only really touched the surface in terms of these, I think the easiest one to explain would be DAC, DAC, drug affinity complex that's on CJC that everyone mm -hmm. probably knows about that. Again, that's a, a sequence of peptides, which changes the half-life of how the peptide enters into circulation. So CJC with no DAC enters into the bloodstream pretty much within you know 30, 60 minutes. With DAC, it's like four or five days is how slow it's going in. So small little changes again i guess the, the best the best example is people thinking that cjc dac in high dosages yields this massive chronic output of growth hormone and always seeing that result was gh bleed where <laughs> eventually you just <laughs> burn out your gh production from such yeah. a high dose it was it's similar to lr3 as well right on paper lr3 initially looked like it was a great product but it turns out the regular IGF Incrolux is really the way to go with that I, I, stuff. I, yeah, that, I, I guess that from a stability perspective, okay, Incrolux is a lot less stable. But you know, in terms of binding affinity, it's not broken. No, it's definitely not broken. But that was the thing initially with animal studies, right? LR3 showed higher binding affinity, but that's not the case in humans. Correct. Yeah, cool. it's, it, it. You know, it's it's really interesting when you when you break it all down. I mean, even to not even go off the tangent of the the different molecular weight growth hormones in terms of like what we we're talking about sequence so you got the mm -hmm. the 191 and 192 kilodalton structure mm -hmm. where a very small change in one of the amino acids weights can change change how the protein folds and and that can have huge effects in terms of how it fits the receptor where yes. for some it might improve binding receptor affinity for us, there might be a very poor interaction. So uh, that, in terms of even like the purity of the product might be high, but the structure of weight is different. of 191 versus 192 can be very slightly different, but again, have big effects, yeah, positive or negative. And there's and there's more, so the standard, what you're talking about, like the 20 or 22 kilodalton GH size, there's other kilodaltons too that are in the human body that we just don't use as performance enhancing drugs, depending on the organ that it's interacting with, they can go into the forties and fifties, right? All sorts of things secrete and accept growth hormone or even your teeth. So it, the, but you're not going to mimic that effect that would not give you a desired outcome similar to like somatrogen would not be the right drug for what, what Correct. you and I are looking for per se. Cool. Yep. Well, I thank you again for coming on. That was always that was great. Amazing. Um, we can do, we'll, we'll hit the rest of that list. Yeah. Well, this worked through. Awesome. Thank you so much. His link tree will be listed down below. Um, I also will put my stuff down below. Thank you. Like and subscribe.